Pastor Don Wallabaugh from Harvest Chapel. We're good. It's really, really good to be back, man. Everybody doing good? I, I am really excited. I, I love being here. I tell people all the time, if I didn't pastor Harvest Chapel, I would just come here. Because, and I mean that, I really do. I, I get to go a lot of places, but I love coming here. I, I appreciate so much the, the staff here and all you guys. That just, it's an amazing house. I love the worship. We could have just worshiped for another hour and a half and went home. I'm good with that, man. It's just, I love the presence of the Lord. You realize you're created for that, right? Yeah, and that's just that's just a big part of, of uh, can I teach you something real quick? Because uh, it's just something, I kind of bring this to the house a lot at home, but really when we do service, because we do like an hour-long worship set at, at home, and, and I love our worship at Harvest as well, and, and, and what happens, because these guys are just rocking, it's just fun. And what I told them, I said, sometimes people will come in and say, man, we just worship too long, why can't we just get to the Word? I really feel like church is divided up into two halves, right? You have worship and the Word, am I right? I mean, if you think about it, you have worship, and it's so, so, technically, the worship is our gift to God, and the word is his gift to us. We worship him for who he is. He gives us the word to empower us to live by. So when we say we worship too long, what we said is we gave God more than we should have, and we're one, what we get, did I say that out loud? Sometimes stuff comes out. I don't plan on it. It just happens. But, but there's a place where men worship, just, just a, it should be part of our DNA. Is we just, man, that's, that's what we're created for that. We're going to worship for a long time in heaven. My, my kids were little, and I, I was teaching them that, and they said, you mean, you mean Dad, like, heaven's just going to be church forever? <laughs> I said, no, there'll be ice cream. I said, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I feel really good. I'm excited. Uh, there's a whole bunch of really neat things going on in life right now, and uh, Pastor Lori is um, actually at home. My, my, my kids and grandkids came in from uh, Florida, and uh, so that she's home with them. They're actually doing a special night tonight. It's called Chick Chat, where a bunch of the ladies get all together, and they, and they just share and do life together and kind of encourage each other and lift each other up. So it's a pretty neat thing. And uh, they're doing that tonight. And uh, so she wasn't able to come with me, so I brought Matt Smith, our youth pastor from Harvest. Amazing young man, love Jesus. And uh, he's going to, yeah, he's, come on, there you go. <laughs> yeah, he's actually going to be with you during the, um, uh, the conference, the iMatter conference. So uh, part of that, that'll be pretty cool. Ryan's been here a few times. Some of you know Ryan Bastris, right? Really neat thing. We were actually, Matt and I were driving up together and we have a staff chat thing that, that goes, it's like called Group Me. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but it's like an inner office chat thing that we can do on our phones. And uh, on, on the way up, got a, a message from Ryan that he had the incredible privilege with tears to be able to lead his four-year-old son to Jesus today. So that's a pretty cool thing. Uh, that's fun. And you might say, no, he's only four. He doesn't understand. Trust me, they understand. It's amazing. Yeah, I need a four-year-old to program my phone. Okay, so, okay but, but, but anyway, amazing things going on. I just love what Jesus is doing. It's a great time to be alive. You guys know my heart in this, man, but I really believe that we're living in the most exciting time ever in the history of the world. That hasn't changed. I'm telling you, it's just getting exciting more and more. Um, I had about 19 different thoughts and, and actually was talking with Matt on the way up and and, and I'm going to share with you actually what I shared this morning at Harvest. And that wasn't my plan, but that kind of shifted on the way here. And I just feel like it's probably a God moment because it's the practicality of the message. I, I know that this house understands identity. That's what I love to preach more than anything. And, and actually I had some thoughts on what I was going to do with that. And then it just kind of shifted. I want to talk to you about the practicality of the gospel. And one of those things is we're in the midst of a series right now called It Is Time. And uh, I love this because I'm, I'm having this incredible privilege. I love doing this. Uh, I love to see the church empowered. The Lord told me back in November, as I was praying into what 2017 ought to look like, he gave me three words. He told me it would be a year of impact, empowerment, and exposure. And I've stayed with that because I feel like it's a year where we're impacting our, our communities, our territory, whatever that. If I use the word metron, you understand that that means your area of influence, right? So it's impacting your metron, your area of influence. There's a place of empowerment and exposure. And the Lord was talking to me about the empowering the people in the, in the house to actually become more of what they were created to be. Does that make sense? Yeah, because yeah, I, I live with this phrase, I am becoming everything God created me to be. That's a good thing to put on your refrigerator. I am becoming more of everything God created me to be. I, I put that on the refrigerator and above the bathroom scale, I put, I must decrease that he might increase. Uh, <laughs> 
that's a good thing above your bathroom scale. <laughs> okay, but, <clears throat> but in the process of that, uh, it, 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 we're looking at impact, empowerment, and exposure. And I asked the Lord, I said, exposure, what's exposure all about? Because it, are, are you exposing the sin in the house? Are you exposing, what do you know? Are you exposing the gifting in the people? And he said, yes, both. That there would be a time where, where sin would be revealed. Why? So that people could get right, right? Because no one, can I say this? No one gets fixed if they don't understand they're broke. I don't even know if that makes sense. It sure does to me, right? And then the other side of that was it was exposing the gifts in the house. So what's happened is over the year, I've been able to take a couple of different series, and what I'm doing is bringing different people on to preach with me. So I'll start the service out, preach maybe the first 10 minutes, give them 15, and then close it out. Does that make sense? Yeah, and that's worked out really, really well. Because why? Because I want to see the body empowered to walk this thing out. So in that place, it's just been fun because we have so much of a depth in the house and so many people in the pews that, that have incredible gifts. How many know you might be sitting by somebody that's so incredibly gifted and you don't even know what they're carrying yet? But part of it is they don't even know what they're carrying. And sometimes it's allowing them that exposure that they begin to even see what's inside of them. I love the idea that there's people around you that maybe you can see gifting in that they can't even see it in themselves. Who understands that? And sometimes our job, what I believe, one of the things that we're called to in the body of Christ is pulling the gifting out of the people around us, raising the bar in their life and challenging them to become more because you're in their life than they would have ever been if, they, if you weren't in their life because you raised the bar and the standard on them. So go with me to Romans 13, 11. It's been the text for the series that I'm doing right now. It's called It Is Time. Romans 13, 11. It says, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time. I, I love the idea that he said high time. I grew up, <laughs> my dad had left home, so I grew up with my mom, but my mom understood how to keep order in the house. And she would get on us sometime, and she'd look at me and she'd say, it's high time you clean that room. Guess what that meant? Now. <laughs> That didn't mean, hey, put that off to a convenient time, or hey, by the end of the week, you, that meant you better get to your room and start cleaning. Why? Because she understood. High time meant, do you understand this? And knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of our sleep. Well, he's not going to tell us to awake out of our sleep unless we've been slumbering. One of the greatest concerns I have in the body of Christ right now, we've had an incredible run with the message of the love of the Father. And I love the message of the Father's love. I'm a huge advocate of becoming love. You'll hear that's a central message of harvest and, and, and walking in love. And we become, we're made in the image of God and God is love and we ought to become love, not just have love. And I understand all that. And I, I, I so appreciate and value the message of the love of the Father, but I don't want to ever live in the place where we've taken the love of the Father and sacrificed it at the altar of compromise. So many people have used the phrase, well, it's okay, and it's not okay. And I'm going to talk about some of that tonight. Because sometimes things that we have now become okay with weren't okay 20 years ago. Why are they okay now? Because society shifted. But we were never called to blend in to society. We were called to stand out from society. Oh, I'm going to have to go after this. Let me read something to you. Can I do this? Anybody ever hear of a guy named William Booth? Anybody know who William Booth was? Some of you should know. Some of you that have studied it. Sure. Uh, Salvation Army, start the, the founder of the Salvation Army, right, William Booth. He lived in the late 1800s, and by the turn, right at the turn of the century, just prior to the turn of the century in the late 1800s, William Booth is looking at what the church was going to face in the coming century, and he penned these words. It's a bold prediction. He said, the chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, and heaven without hell. That was 120 years ago, but if I look at that today, how much of that do you see happening? And, and I have a concern. This is why Paul writes, and he says, and knowing the time that now it's high time to awake out of that slumber, wake out of sleep. Why? Because now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. 
I, I got to tell you, I'm 57 years old. You know what? I, I got born again at 18, so I look back on those years, and I think what Lori and I got married, at tw- I was 20, and when we had our first child, Nicole, I, I remember preaching saying, well, I'll never have to worry about her wrecking my car. Why? Because I was sure Jesus was coming. Come on. Come on. I was confident that he would come. And, and, and I mean, I was around when they had to book out 88 reasons why the Lord will come in 88. Who remembers? Come, oh, yeah. Come on. 88 reasons why the Lord will come in 88. The following year, they had 89 reasons why he didn't come in 88. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> but, but come on. But come on. We were looking for the rapture. We were looking. I saw your anti rapture device. I think it's awesome. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, boing, boing, never mind. Okay. So, but, but, but I look at this and I, I think about this stuff and it, and it stays with me. And I, I was sure, remember Y2K? Some of you are my age, you remember Y2K? Surely, man, all the planets are lining up and the quadrant and all this stuff, the gravitational pulls. There was all this stuff because what we were looking for Jesus coming. Why? Because we felt like our salvation was near. But how many understand we're closer today than we've ever been? You're closer now than when I said it. Oh, wait a minute, you're closer now. <laughs> closer again. <laughs> come, on, come on. Now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. And we have to understand something, that when we look at the world around us, can I say this, the clock's ticking. And we realize, how many watch the news this week? Come on, you have terrorism, you have more violence, you have more un- ungodliness that's running rampant. I mean, this stuff is happening in front of us, and it's biblical. It's, it's this biblical stuff happening on the front page of your newspaper, on the headlines of your news stories. And we realize something's ticking. And we can't be lulled to sleep. I think in the last nine months, we've had six vans that have run into large crowds in different places and destroyed a bunch of people. The first time it happened, it was shocking. The second time it was happened, it says, oh, my goodness. You know what? By the sixth time, we're like, oh, they did that again. What happened? We were becoming desensitized. I don't even know if you understand that, but there's a place where I really feel like that's a place the devil just really works, desensitization. And we become like it's, well, I guess it's just the way it is. And the church, rather than praying fervently, becomes, can I say, lulled to sleep. And there's a place where we have to understand that that becomes really, really important. I'm going to talk to you about some things today that I really believe we have to, be, we have to, we have to overcome. So, so I'm going to look at some things, if that's all right. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 8 through 16. How many understand? My pastor, a, 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 pretty, a pretty nice group of folks, and one of the things that happens, you, I do a lot of counseling. So I'm in my counseling room, and you know what people are saying? I hear it over and over. Man, it's getting darker out here. It's really getting darker out here. You know what? I get excited over that. And I don't even know if that makes sense to everybody, but here's the reality. Underneath these bright lights, if I light a match, you know what will happen? You'll see it, but it's not a big deal. But if you turn off all the lights in the house and I light that match, all of a sudden, whoa, that's a big deal. Why? Because the darker it gets, the brighter your light ought to shine. There's a place where we understand that when the world around us is getting darker, that's just a great place for the body of Christ to rise up and shine. Why? Because people get attracted to the light in the darkness. If you're in a dark place and you see a light, what's happening? You're migrating toward the light. People ought to be migrating toward your life because they see the light of Christ in you. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. Let's go with this and see what the Lord does, okay? I don't know where we're going to end up, but I know where we're going to start, and then we'll just have fun, okay? For you were sometime darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Oh, That's an hour. (laughs) For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it's a shame even to speak of the things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore, he says, arise thou that sleepest, uh, uh, awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. I want to do a breakdown on those verses if it's all right. So let's go back and let's just take a look for just a minute, okay? Let let, let me jump right into verse 13 because it's kind of where my heart's really at right now. All things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. The word manifest is an interesting word. It actually would translate revealed. Like uh, 1 John 3 and 8. Who knows 1 John 3 and 8? 
For this purpose was the Son of Man made manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. What's he saying? Come on. What's he saying? Jesus is revealed to what? Crush hell. Right? So he's revealed in Sean to crush hell. He's revealed in Alden to crush hell. Do you understand? Come on. There's a place where we understand. The word manifest means to reveal. All right? So Jesus was manifested or revealed so that we would see what God was really like. I, I want you to see what he's saying right here. Then let's look at this for just a second. Whatever things are reproved are made manifest by the light. The, the, what's done in darkness is revealed when the light gets turned on. Does that make sense? That's what he's saying. Now watch, because this gets really strong. He says this. He says, for whatsoever does make manifest is light. What did he say? Whatever brings revelation is light. What was he saying? He was saying that light equates to revelation. Over and over when we see the word light, it actually lends itself to the concept of revelation. How many of you remember the song, I saw the light? What's it mean? I got to revelation. Who's ever said the light just came on? What happened? You got the revelation. Why? Because light equates to revelation. So when we start reading this stuff, what we have to look at is begin to understand that when we see the word light, he's lending itself to the concept of getting a revelation or an understanding of something. So let's look at that underneath those words, okay? So what he's saying is, awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you revelation. Does that make sense? What he's saying is, wake up, get out of your sin. Jesus wants to give you the revelation. Back up to verse 8. You were one time darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. What's it mean? You were in darkness, but when the light came, something shifts inside of you, and now you're walking in revelation that you didn't have before. Over and over, what I believe the church is being challenged to in this hour is to walk in the revelation that you receive. I think there's a lot of head knowledge in the body of Christ but we need an 18-inch transfer that it actually becomes not just a cranial thing but a cardio thing, and it gets into our heart, and we're walking this thing out because knowing what to do in doing something is oftentimes two different things. I've got people in my house right now, in my church, not in, my, not in the house I live in. That'd be Lori, and I can't preach bad about her. Okay, but, but, but she's not here. Well, never mind. Okay, but, but, but stay with me, okay? Because I've got people in church right now that, that absolutely love Jesus. I mean, they love Jesus. They could actually teach in my identity school and do an amazing job. But when crisis hits, they act like they never even heard the word. Do you understand what I just said? They got it here. It's just getting it here so you can walk it out there. That becomes the reality of the gospel. That's what we need. So think with me for just a minute as we look back over a couple of verses right here because I want you to see some things, okay? He said, you were darkness, but now you're light. Walk. He just said, you were this, but now you're that. So don't walk like this. Walk like that. Does that make sense? You can't keep walking like that and claim to be this. Am I right? You can't claim to be light and keep walking like you're in darkness. As a matter of fact, let me show you something. Psalms 119, verse 130, you know what it says? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Does he say that? Come on. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What's he saying there? That's pretty powerful. He's saying the word is a lamp to my feet. Why? For the present moment and a light to my path. That's the future. Come on, this is covering me in the present, and the lamp is, oh, it's, it's just not my feet right now. It's the path that I'm going to walk. It'll show me where I'm at and tell me where I'm going. Why? Because his word brings light, and in that revelation, it's what it calls me to walk out. But if I refuse to walk it out, now what am I going to do? I'm going to stumble off the path. And then what? I'm back in darkness again. You were darkness, but that's not who you are anymore. I have to see myself. When I talk about being light, let me, let me, let me cover a couple more verses. I'm going to show you this because I'll just walk this out with you and then we'll get, I'm going to go after it. Go to 1 John chapter 1. I'll give you a minute to turn there. I want you to see verses 5, 6, and 7 because they're really powerful. And then, then I'm going to go after this. We'll see what God does. Verse 5, this then is the message that we have heard of him, and we declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God is light. Did you catch that? He didn't say God has light. He said he is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. Stay with me. Watch what he says. If we say then that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and we don't do the truth. 
But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The word cleanseth there is actually written in the pers- present participle, which means it's an ongoing, continuing process. That's an incredible word right there. But, but I want to take you back to this. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we were to have a group of scientists in the room right now, they would tell you something. Scientists are people that are much smarter than me. And, and, and they would tell you, in reality, that darkness doesn't even exist. Darkness is the word we use for the absence of light. Cold doesn't exist. Cold is the word we use for the absence of heat. But it doesn't in its own right exist. You follow what I'm saying? Right? God is light. <laughs> and in him, darkness doesn't exist. Now, if light is revelation, then I would tell you that darkness is the absence of revelation. If, come on, if cold, come on, if light, if darkness is just the absence of light, then, then when we see it in a spiritual sense, if light represents revelation, darkness is the absence of revelation. <laughs> oh, oh. So God is light, <laughs> and in him there's never absence. Because <sighs> God's never absent. <laughs> the, the, the revelation that you have to walk in him, to understand that. And this is the big key to me. I, I see this over and over, and I challenge our folks all the time. But it's a place of, hey, if we're going to claim this thing, let's walk it out. Let's make it the reality of our life. Let's do it right. No compromise. God is light, and in him there is no darkness. It doesn't even exist. Whew. That's so powerful to me. Because I feel like God's speaking to us about some of this stuff. John 8 and 12, again, same concept, same idea, same theories. Walk with me. Let's take a look. John chapter 8, verse 12. I love this stuff because it takes me somewhere. In verse 12, he says this is Jesus. Then spake Jesus again unto them and said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. What did he say? I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Now, what's he saying? He that followeth me, can I say this? He called us to follow him, and he don't have a Twitter account. Come on. (laughs) It's not following me on social media. What's he saying? He's actually calling us to follow him. Can I talk to you really plain? I just want to get real plain with you guys, okay? Here's the deal. You got James and John, the sons of Zebedee. I'm just going to use them as one example, right? What was their profession? Anybody know? Come on, they're fishermen, right? And when Jesus first encounters them, where's he encounter them? He encounters them at the boat with their father. They've got several boats. They're mending their nets. It's, an, it's after the morning fishing, if you would. They've got a bunch of fish maybe laying around. I'm not sure what all might be going on, but they're mending their nets, right? And when he encounters them, what's he do? He says, follow me. And you know what the Bible says? And straightway they left their nets and followed him. Now, I don't know about you, but in the natural, I'm going to think about that for a minute and think that's not very logical. They've got a successful business. They've been in business with their father. Some strange rabbi comes along and says, hey, follow me. And they, cool, let's follow him. Because that doesn't seem logical. Unless they're teenagers. No, never mind. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 if you looked at it in the natural sense, in our Western culture mindset, and we hear that, it doesn't even register as to why would they do that. And I've heard people even preach on it and say, well, the apostolic anointing in Jesus' life placed a draw on the gifting inside of them, and they knew that they were to call to answer the call of God upon their life and follow. I, that sounds really spiritual. I don't think it's true. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, you have to understand Hebrew culture. In the culture of the Hebrews, James and John, as young children, would have went to to school. I don't remember the name of the school. I can't remember what it was called. I used to know this. But they would actually go to school for six years. And during that six years, from the time they were six until the time they were 12, they would actually study what's called the Pentateuch, the first five books of the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They would study it to the place where they would have it memorized. I think that's amazing to memorize the Pentateuch. It took me six years to learn the order of the books, <laughs> let alone the whole deal. 
Right? Come on. This is a big deal. But in the midst of that, they would study to learn that. And then out of that school, what would happen is the rabbi would come. They would interview, test, and, and, and go back and forth with all these different students. And they would select a handful of them, right, that would go on to the next school. Right? And there'd be another school that would actually go for three years. During that three years, they would teach them the, the, the Hebrew culture. They would teach them all the different, uh, 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 about all the different ceremonies, the feasts, and what they were all about, and the significance of all those. And they would study the history of the Jewish nation. And they would study all these things. Why? Because they're training them for service. By the end of those three years, they would have been through nine years of school. And out of that, out of every class that was coming out, the rabbis would get together. They would confer. They would interview and test one more time. And then the head rabbi would actually take his, uh, his uh, talit, if you would, off of his shoulders, put it around one of the students, and here's the words he would use, follow me. Follow me. What did that mean to them? That meant you can know what I know. You can do what I do. You can be just like me. Every young Hebrew boy had the desire to one day hear, follow me, because that was considered one of the greatest achievements. And if you got the follow me from the rabbi, your family was elevated. Your father couldn't have been happier. It was an incredible day for the family when you would hear that. So when Jesus comes walking by and actually would have thrown his tallit on James and thrown his tallit on John, he would have said, follow me. And that was like a day of incredible history because if they're back fishing with their dad, that meant somewhere they got cut off, whether it was the sixth grade, whether it was the ninth grade, whatever, and they went back to this and felt like they weren't good enough, but now what they actually heard is, wait a minute, you can know what I know, you can do what I do, you can be just like me. That, that's an amazing reality, because here's the deal, that's why in John 14, 12, when Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth in me, the works that I do, you'll do. Why? Because he said, follow me. That's why Peter's out on the boat, and, there, and the storm's raging, and Jesus comes walking by on the water. And what did he say? Don't be afraid, it's me. What did Peter say? If it's really you, bid me to come. And Jesus said, come, and Peter jumped out of the boat. Why? Because you can know what I know. You can do what I do. You can be just like me. Do you understand that? So when Jesus said, follow me, right? He that followeth me won't walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We're called to follow him. Why? To do what he does, to be like him. We're called to be just like him. That's an amazing reality. So watch this. He says when we follow him, we won't be in darkness, but we'll have the light of light. What's that mean? That means you'll have revelation, not an absence of revelation, when you're following him. This is a big deal to me. It's about understanding what we're actually called to, to know him, to understand him, to walk with that. And to me, it's, it's, it's huge. Can I say this? Revelation comes from following Jesus, not just going to church. Revelation comes from following him. Not your favorite preacher, your favorite. Please hear, there's nothing wrong with that. You say, well, pastor, I follow Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen has a great church, but he doesn't have a heaven to take you to. Do you understand this? I, I love this, so stay with me and just think for me a minute. Is your life a life that says the people around you can see you're following him. My heart's really moved right now. There's some things that are just heavy, so go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, look at verses 5 through 11. To me, this is, this is powerful things. Let's look together. 1 Thessalonians, if you can't find it, go to 2 Thessalonians and back up. You're all children of the light and children of the day. We're not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hasn't appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Let me stop right there. That's powerful to me. Please hear what he just said, because the words that he said are very strong. What he was saying, we're of the day, we're not of the night. 
You are all children of the light, children of light, and children of the day. We're not of the night, we're not of darkness. What's he saying? You have revelation. He's writing to the church at Thessalonica. He's saying, church, you got revelation. You've got light. You're not of the darkness. You're not called to walk like, can I say this? If you're living in such and your unsaved friend experienced the same crisis and you respond to it just like them, why would they ever want what you're carrying? Do you understand what I just said? Come on, you ought to respond to life differently than they do. You ought to, re- you ought to be having something. Can I say this? Your joy ought to look different than their joy. Because watch, if you're not if you're not born again, your joy is based out of your circumstances and your day. But if you're born again and you know Jesus, then your joy is based out of a relationship with heaven. And you know what? The circumstances of the day were never the measuring stick of your joy. Whew. We're not of the night. We're of the day. Everybody see that? That's strong to me. The night's darkness, but you're called to something more. Watch what he says. He said, let's not sleep as do others, but let's watch and be sober. Why? Because they that sleep, sleep in the night. What's the night? The night's darkness. Why? What's darkness? It's the absence of revelation. Those that are drunk are drunk in the night. Why? Because they don't have the revelation of who they are. They don't understand what they were created for, and they're living for the pleasures of this world only. Paul said, if it were for the, but for the things of this life only, I'd be of all men most miserable. People of the night ought to respond to life differently than people of the day. Am I making sense? What's he referring to? Light and darkness. There's an antithesis there. They, they look separate. They look very different. They're, 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 they're... When I think about these things, they, they just touch my heart in such a way. So he's saying this. They that sleep in the night... They that are drunk are drunken in the night. Did you catch that? Do you understand that when somebody treats you wrong or mistreats you or does something wrong, they're of the night? What's it mean? They don't have the revelation. They don't even understand who they are. They only treated you that way because that's the only way they know how to respond to life. Why? Because they don't have the revelation that you have. We get mad at sinners when they sin. They're sinners. (laughs) You You don't get mad at a plumber when he plums. Come on. Am I making sense? Come on. When people act a certain way or respond in a certain way, sometimes we have to be able to see them and understand they're of the night. And they don't have the revelation that you have. And sometimes when somebody talks bad about you or mistreats you or or cheats on you or hurts you in some manner or some way, rather than be offended by that, why don't we stop and think, wait a minute, but they don't have the revelation that we have. And if they had the revelation that we have, maybe they wouldn't have been that way. And we don't need to be mad at them. We need to be praying for them because once they get a revelation of who they are in Christ, they'll respond to life differently. So many times, can I talk to you? I was talking to a young lady at my church, and right now she's in, a, in the midst of, a, of a, a, a legal mess. It's just a disaster, really. It's a pretty bad situation. And, and, and she's actually there with a family that she loves whose son did something heinous. He did something really bad, right? And so she's with the mother of that son. You follow where I'm at? Right, the boy did a terrible thing, and the mother of that uh, of of the boy is going, and she's really close friends with the mother, and she's there rep- with the mom, trying to support and encourage her. Right? Why? Because mom's hurting, because the boy did something really, really terrible, and he's probably going to prison for a really, really, really long time. You follow what I'm saying? Right? Who's hurting here? Right? Over here is the people that he did the crime to, and there's this whole group of folks, and you know what they're called? The victims' advocates. Do you understand? Do you ever victim advocacy? There's a there's a word for it. The victims advocacy group, right? And what are they there? They're there to support the victims. Why? Because the victims have been hurt. Who's supporting this mom? Because there's not one set of people that are hurt here. Who understands what I just said? But we got to be able to see through the lens of if the boy knew who he was in Christ, he'd have never did what he did. But drugs and alcohol played a role in his choice, and all of a sudden now there's terrible, heinous problems. Please hear what I'm saying. Can I talk to you? If you walk into a hospital room, and there's two beds. On this bed is a 23-year-old boy. On this bed is a 23-year-old boy. This boy is full of cancer and dying. He's in fourth stage. It's bad. 
He's weak. He's taking chemo. There's a whole lot going on. This boy overdosed with heroin. And you feel bad for this boy, but not this one. There's something twisted in your mentality because Jesus' blood paid a price for both of them. God loves this one just as much as he loves that one. And we have to learn what that looks like. Why? Why? Darkness came. Darkness. Oh, do you understand what I'm saying? Darkness came and overtook one. Do you understand? Sickness came and overtook one. Darkness came and overtook the other. And I hope you can understand that because watch, we're called to be children of the day. We're called to carry light. We ought to be reaching out to this one. Just And it's no different than we reached out to that one. We ought to be able to love this one the same way we love that one. I hope I'm making sense. But he's calling us. Why? Because we're called to be carriers of a light that changes the world around us. Come on, when light comes into darkness, guess what? Darkness got to flee. You walk into a dark room, what do you do? Turn on the light. You walk into a light room, you can't turn on the dark. <laughs> I'm going to bed now, I'm going to turn on the dark. Who says that? Nobody says, oh, I'm tired, I think I'm just going to turn on the dark and go to sleep. Come on. How, do you, how do you make it dark? Absence of light. Yeah. Why is that boy in trouble? There was an absence of light in his life. What's light? Revelation. If he understood or had the revelation, he'd have never gotten that trouble. I hope I'm making sense right now because there's a place where we have to grab a hold of this. Here's why. If I can go here, go to, go to Matthew chapter 5. You guys know this verse. 14, you are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. Men don't light a candle and put it under a bushel basket, but they put it on a candlestick that what? That it might give light to all that are in the house. Oh, I want to talk to you right now. We just sang a song, and I love it, but I changed the words on it. Okay? Could you guys do that? Do you change words in some of your songs? I change words in my songs. When I'm singing them, I just do, right? You know what? But, but, but I love this. You made a way for me to enter the holy place, right? Who knows that's true? Thank God. How about this? You made a way for me. If you understand this, what was the holy place? In the Old Testament, in the tabernacle, what was the holy place? It was the place where God abides, right? Come on. You had the outer court, the inner court. You had the, 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 the court of the priest, and you had the, uh, well, you had the court of the Gentile. The, you really? Okay, you had the outer court. You had the inner court. You had the court of the women. Then you had the, the, the court of the men. Then you had the court of the priest. Then you had the holy place, and then you had the most holy place. Am I right? Come on. So here's the deal. You made a way for me to become the holy place. No, I, sure. Oh. Why? Because I know who I am in Christ. I know that he's in me. Why? I am the holy place. Why? It's the place where God abides. He abides in me. Come on, he lives right here. When I know he lives right here, I am the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill can't be hid. Oh. You don't light a candle and put it under a bushel basket. But you light a candle and put it on a candlestick. What's it say? That it might give light unto what? All that are in the house. Read that. What's it mean? That means your light wasn't just for you. Yeah. Your light wasn't so you could feel good about who you are. Your light was to give light to all the house. <laughs> You're, to all that are in that, come on. What's that mean? Everyone that's in your metron, everyone that's in your area, everyone that's around you, your light ought to be shining. Come on. Oh. Who remembers the Fantastic Four? Come on. Remember Johnny? Was it Johnny Storm, right? What did he say? Flame on. Come on. Is that amazing or what? What if we didn't become the Fantastic Four? What if we became the Fantastic 400? Flame on. Come on. Flame on. Why? Because why? Because people are attracted to that. I'm going to tell you something. If you bust out in flames, people are going to watch you. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Oh. What if our light shines so brightly that the people around us actually got hungry for what we were carrying? What if you lived in such a place that people were jealous for what you had? You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill can't be hid. When you understand, here's what Jesus said. Before he ever said, can I teach you what he said right here? This is powerful. You are the light of the world. When he said that, it was actually during the Feast of Hanukkah. Do you understand that's the Feast of Lights? Now, understand this and picture, if you can, Jerusalem, the city of the old city of Jerusalem. It was a walled city with four, uh, if I can, there were four distinct corners in the old city that you could actually go to today and actually see where they were. 
But in each one, they had a 75-foot tower, right? 70 foot, 75 foot tall. On the top of every one of those towers, they had a 60-gallon bowl, if you would. It was a bowl, like a, a basin, you understand? And they filled it with oil. What'd they do? They lit it. 60 gallons of fuel burning in the sky at night during the Feast of Lights. On the four corners of the, of the old city of Jerusalem, what do you think that did for miles around? Everybody took notice. Wow, look at that blazing light. And Jesus is on the Mount of Olives speaking to this group right now. And what's he saying? You are the light of the world. <laughs> that, that, that's amazing to me. Now listen, he was, he's not on the Mount of Olives. He's on the Mount of the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> I was there and I can't remember what it's called. But that's okay. Here's the reality of that. He's teaching them you're the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill can't be hid. What? What's he saying? How are you going to hide that? And your, your light's supposed to be brighter than that light. Whew. Prior to it, he said, I am the light of the world. But how many understand that Jesus lives inside of you? Now, if he's the light of the world and he lives inside of you, do you know what he told you? Be holy. Why? Because the more holes, the more the light will shine. <laughs> be holy. The holy you are, the more the light's going to shine out of you. Oh. What if we actually lived in that place where the holiness of God, because you have to understand that holiness is an attribute given to God, but his people carry it because they carry God inside of them. Whew. What if we carried that to a place where people were so attracted that said, man, I want that. See, I've been around long enough to know I was, I was part of the holiness group before we became charismatic and all the other things. We were called holiness people. I don't mind that title. I know that it carried with it a thought of legalism and your hair buns and all that, you know what I mean, Don't all that stuff. And women couldn't cut their hair and men had to. I got so spiritual, I just took mine all out. <laughs> Here's the reality of that. We're called to walk this thing out in such a place that the world around us is attracted to what we have. So we look at our lives. Here's what Jesus says, and I love this. You're the light of the world, man. When you walk into Revelation of Sunset, when you understand your true identity, when you understand the finished work of the cross, when you know your real value, you bring light everywhere you go. That's why you're on a candlestick. Does that make sense? You're called that your light would shine. So let your light shine before men that they might see the good works you do and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's the next verse. It's verse 16. Let your light shine before men. Let your light shine before men. You know what he says after that? They might see your good works. I thought it wasn't about works. But he said, let your light shine before men that they might see your good works. It's not about works. See, you don't work to get, you get. And because you got, the works follow you. It's the natural byproduct of having Christ inside of you. The next thing you know, what? You become love. And what's love? Love is just, uh, is, it's got, love's got to have some works to it or it's just words. Come on. Come on, no, listen, I'm, I'm telling you, I do a lot of counseling, but I'm, I'm, I'm counseling this girl, and, and you know what? Her husband beats her. And I said, why do you go back? Because he says he loves me. Come here, let me love you. <laughs> How dumb is that? If it's only words, it's nothing. Your works have to follow. James said, you say you got faith? I'll show you my faith by my works. Why? Because your works follow after you that they might see the good works you do, and then what happens? Come on, you understand in your identity, you're walking this thing out in such a place that, you know what, your works are even identifying you as a child of God. Why? They, come on, th there was an old song. I'm from that, I'm, I'm, I've been around a long time, but they said they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. How are they going to know? Because they'll see it. James, John 13, 35, by this will all men know that you are my disciples. Why? Because you have love one for another, right? It's there. You have love one for another, right? How are they going to see it? How are they going to know it? you, you got to express it. It's your actions. And they see that place in you. Why? Because you're walking that thing out. Let me ask you something. I just had this conversation. It was actually my, my worship leader, one, one of my worship leaders started a new job recently. Guy's amazing. He's been there a month. You know what's happening? The whole group that he's working with is now talking with him about Jesus all the time. They know where he stands. They know what he does. They know, they, they, they know his walk. They understand who he is. One of the ladies says, comes to him and says, you know what, Jason, you've been, here for a, you've been here for a month, and everybody knows where you stand. Everybody knows your walk with God. Everybody knows. She said, I'm a Christian. I've been here three years, and nobody even knows it. 
And he looked at her and said, you better fix that. Who understands what I just said? Come on, man. You weren't called to be a 007 secret agent for Jesus. <laughs> There's something about you and I understanding what our walk ought to look like. The practical application of your faith is what's absolutely necessary if we're going to transform the world. How does our faith apply in the workplace? How does our faith apply in government? How does our faith apply in the educational system? How does our faith apply in, 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 the, in, the, in the entertainment industry? How does our faith apply on social media? I put a picture of a washing machine out one time. I said, this is where your dirty laundry goes, not Facebook. Do you understand what I'm saying? Come on. Come on, because Facebook, some people say, oh, Facebook's bad. Some people say, oh, Facebook's good. It's not good or bad. It's a tool. It's how you use it that makes it good or bad. Whew. Let me talk to you, man. Keep your face in this book. You'll be all right. Oh. You're called to raise the bar on the people that are around you. You're called to challenge them. Your life should challenge the people in your Metron. You understand what I just said? Come on. Thank God for the people who came along and raised the bar on us. The people that came along and challenged us that we could become more because they're in our life than we'd have ever been if they weren't in our life. They challenged us to walk this thing out. They challenged us to become more. Thank God for the people who, who spoke into our life and said they actually believed in us even when we didn't believe in ourselves. They challenged us. Thank God for those people. Now look at this. Go, go with me to Luke yeah, I got time. Let's do this. Go to Luke 11, because this is big time to me right here. Luke 11, 34 through 36, okay? Watch what he says. I love this. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is single, your whole body is full of light. But when your eye is evil, your body is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in you be not darkness. If your whole body, therefore, be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light as when a bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. You read that, and it's, it's kind of complicated. So let me give you the simple understanding if I can. Because my simplistic mind, I guess, says this. He said, walk in all the light you see. Walk in what you understand. Walk in everything that, can I go here? Come on. When you understand to do something, guess what? Do it. Do it. And you say, well, I don't completely understand it. Do you know all the stuff I don't completely understand and they let me pastor? <laughs> this is amazing. Okay, but, but here's the reality. I'll just walk in what I do understand. And guess what? If I walk in what I do understand, there's going to be people that will come against me. But I can't let what they don't understand keep me from walking in what I do understand. I'm going to walk in what I understand. I'm going to do what I know I need to do. There was stuff I didn't understand. Here's what happened. Can I talk to you really plain? I was a young boy, 18 years old. I get born again. There's a whole bunch of craziness going on in my life. I won't even get into that. But here's the deal. I'm going to Sunday school. About the third Sunday school class I go to, the Sunday school teacher's teaching on tithing. Now, I, they, she said, do you tithe? She said, do you pay your tithes? I said, I wear some. Because my idea of tithes was you put them on with a suit. I didn't even know the other word, right? And she began to explain what tithing was all about. Gave me scriptures on tithing. Talked about how God would bless the tenth, the ninety. If I gave the tenth, I didn't understand it. I just knew what she told me. I saw it in the scripture. So I said, God, this is the real deal. Then I'm going to do that. I remember this, and I'll talk to you real plain. Then we'll move on from that. But here's the deal: on a Wednesday night, I went to church. I was making hundred dollars a week because it's 1982, so that's pretty good money. I was making $100 a week. I took $10, put it in an envelope. I took it, and I took it into church and put it in the offering on my Wednesday night service. Does everybody follow what I'm saying? Now, I'm 18 years old. I'm a brand-new Christian. I don't know much of anything, but I put it in, and I prayed. Here's my prayer. God, did you see that? Because I figure if I'm going to do it, I want credit. And I began to explain to God what a big sacrifice that was, but, but it would really bless the church, and the pastor was Lee Carbaugh, and he needed some help. And I went into, I went into a whole explanation of how good I just did because I didn't understand much. But that was on Wednesday night, and I was working for J.C. Brady. I was making $3.25 an hour. And on Friday, I got a phone call from Heckett Engineering to go to work at Allegheny Ludlam Steel making $8.50 an hour. In 1978, $8.50 an hour put a jingle in your pocket. 
and I went to work in a steel mill in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I felt like what God was doing was honoring that I was walking in the light that I understood. I didn't understand a whole lot, but I'd walk in what I understood. And I made God a promise that I would walk in what I understood. So I want to talk to you about walking in your understanding, the practical application of your faith. Let me talk to you real plain. When I got born again, you have to understand, I came out of a world that was messed up. So here's the deal. I drank a lot of alcohol before I got born again. So I made a covenant with God that I would never let alcohol cross these lips again on the night I got saved. Anybody understand what I just said? I told the Lord I wouldn't do that. I'm not telling you you have to do it. I'm telling you that's what I told the Lord that I would do. So here's the deal. From that day until this, no alcohol has crossed my lips. Why? Because I made a covenant with God. Lori and I went to Italy to do a conference in Italy. And how many understand in Europe they live a little different? And there's beer and wine everywhere. So I called the guy that was holding the conference. His name was Renil. And I called Renil ahead of time. And I told him, I said, listen, man, Lori and I are coming. But here's the deal. We made a covenant with God. And I know what you guys do. And I'm not trying to take away from what you guys do. I'm simply telling you is don't be offended. We'll drink soda. We'll drink water. But we won't drink beer. We won't drink wine. Because we made a covenant together that we weren't going to do that. Here's why. Because I made a promise to God. If you make a promise to God, here's a good deal. Keep it. Walk in the light that you have. That was light for me. I hope I'm making sense. You understand that? I promised God on the night I got born again that I wouldn't cuss or swear ever again. Why? Because I cussed and swore all the time. So I told God I won't do that. I was 18 years old, right? Now, I got saved on a Sunday night. Here's the truth of that whole story. On Monday morning, Right, it was February of 1978. I was doing construction for J.C. Brady at the time, so we did fire restoration. So we went in. We're shingling a house in South, in, in in Western Pennsylvania, right? And here's the deal: I'm out there. It's cold out, and we're pounding shingles. We didn't have the nail guns back then. It was just an apron and a hammer, right? And I'm hammering nails. And here's the deal: I hit the wrong nail. Right there. And as soon as I did, I mean, it came out. Why? Because it had for years. And as soon as I did, I started crying. Now, the guys that were with me knew I was a tough kid. I, I was a boxer for the Butler Cubs. There's a whole bunch of things. I was a street boy. But here's the reality of that. In that place, I'm crying. They think I'm crying because I hurt my hand. My hand didn't hurt. My heart did. Because I remember telling God, God, can I talk to you? I told the Lord. I said, Lord, I can't even do this thing for 12 hours. <laughs> and the Lord began to just speak to my heart. I spent that whole day repenting. I went, I, can I, I'll tell you the whole story real quick. I went, I went home that night. I got in my van. I, I cleaned up. I went up to see Lori, and she said, my mother-in-law, one of the most incredible, faithful Christian women on the planet ever, right? And I said to her, she said, how was your day, Dawn? She's all excited. She's more excited I got born again than I was. I, I promise you. She's been my biggest fan, right? But here's the deal. In that same place, I, she said, how was your day? I said, I don't even want to talk about it. She said, what do you mean? I said, it was horrible. She said, what do you mean it was horrible? Because she's all excited because I got born again the night before. I should be the most joyful guy on the planet. And she, she said, what happened? I said, I blew it. She said, what happened? And I told her that I hit my hand and I cussed. And, 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 and I said, I can't believe I couldn't even do this for 12, uh, for 12 hours. I can't even believe that. And, I, and she said, well, did you ask the Lord to forgive you? I said, a thousand times. She looked at me and she said, you told God a thousand times you're sorry? And I said, yeah. She said, oh, my goodness. And I said, what? She said, you confused heaven. I said, what do you mean? She said, the first time you repented and told God you were sorry, he took your sin, cast it in the sea of forgetfulness, and said, I'll never remember it again. I said, okay. She said, the next 999 times, God said, what are you talking about? And heaven has been confused all day, and it's your fault. <laughs> I think that's amazing. <laughs> So God, I'd walk in the light. Can I tell you something? From that day till this, one day after I was saved, I cussed. But from that day till this, never another cuss words come out of my mouth. Why? I made a covenant with God. I hope I'm making sense. You can do this. I'm talking to the church right now. See, if you walk in the light to the best of your knowledge and ability, I promise you, Holy Spirit will be your helper. But I got to teach you something real quick if I can. The word for Holy Spirit is paraclete, and it literally translates helper, right? Do you know that he's the helper, not the doer? He'll help you, not do it for you. That is really good. He's the helper, not the doer. You got that? That's a big word for me. Okay, stay with me. I, I just want to talk to you. If your eye is single, your whole body is filled with light. It's making sense. There's a place where we choose not to walk in darkness. There's a place where we choose because it's your choice. I promise you it's your choice. James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Whew. 
See, if God is light, then there's no room for shadow. Because shadow is just a place where there's an absence of light. If I stand right here, I cast a shadow there. Why? Because I'm blocking the light. But God is light. There can't be a shadow. That's so good. And out of that place, what's he say? Every good and every perfect gift cometh down. Look at your Bible. I don't care what version you have. It doesn't say the Father of light. It says the Father of lights. Why? Because you're the lights, and he's your Father. You're called to look like him. You're called to be like him. You have to be a light. You're called to be a light everywhere that you go. The call of God on your life, be a light. Why? Because there's somebody around you in darkness. Because there's somebody around you that needs you to be you. The light that you carry will make a difference in somebody's life as long as you let it out. But it's up to you how much light you let out. When I first got born again, we went door to door passing out tracks. Anybody ever do that? Y'all, some, some of the old people, come on, there's old people in this house. Okay, come on, come on. We went knocking on doors, passing out tracks. So I, I got so excited about passing out tracks, I'm going to go everywhere and pass out tracks. And I uh, had a big old beard at the time, and I had a big old black felt cowboy hat and blue jean jacket, and I knock on this lady's door, and she, and she, she opens the door, and I'm standing there with like this, and she went, ah, and slammed the door. <laughs> my hair was pretty long. It was down below my shoulders. Hang on. Hang on a minute. Memories. Feels pretty good. Okay. All right. We're good. Okay. In those days, my goal, my, my thought was, I want to be a light. I want to do this thing well. I, I, I want to represent God in the best way that I can. And, and, and here's the deal. Almost 40 years later, that hasn't changed at all. The passion still burns in me. I might not knock on doors and pass out tracks, but I promise you, very few waitresses get by me. I love the idea that we can represent him everywhere we go. Why? Because he's the father of lights. you got to be a light where you're at, man. This is the call of God on your life, to be a light, to be a light. Flame on. Let me close this thing with 1 Peter 2 and 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now let's go back to the original. What were we saying? If light represents revelation, then what he said is he called you from a place of no revelation into a place of revelation. He called you from walking in, 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 with no understanding into a place of walking with understanding. Do you understand that? And, and this is huge. Because he said something about you. He said, you're a chosen generation. Isn't it amazing that you get to live in this generation? You're living in the most exciting time ever in the history of the world. There's never been a time like this time. And i got to tell you something, man. It's getting more and more exciting all the time. Right now, as a matter of fact, this week they'll start, and they're doing a a big deal in Prague. There's a whole bunch of my friends that are in Prague right now, and they're going to do this thing called Awaken Europe. It's in Prague. Why is it in Prague? Because it was 500 years ago in that same town that they nailed the Reformation on the wall. It was Martin Luther. Come on. And you know what happened? 500 years have passed, but I'm telling you, God does something every 500 years that's absolutely major. I don't have time to give you the history of it, but I'm going to tell you, I believe that this is the most exciting time that we've had in 500 years. You're a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. I have people all the time come to me and say, Pastor, I want to be in full-time ministry. I said, welcome to the royal priesthood. You're in full-time ministry. I don't care who's signing your paycheck. You're in full-time ministry. You might be a plumber. You might be a carpenter. You might be a CNA or a CEO, but you're in full-time ministry. You are called to represent him full-time and minister the gospel as you go. That's your call. Be a light. Let your light shine. Touch people's lives. You're a holy nation. Walk in holiness. Make people hungry for what you're carrying. He said you're a peculiar people. That didn't mean you're supposed to act peculiar. The word peculiar there actually in the Greek lends itself to the idea of ownership. You belong to God. It lends itself to the concept of divine ownership. You are his possession. 
Why? That you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of that into this. Whew. Called you out of darkness. Called you into light. We ought to walk like that. This is the call of God on our life. The practical application of our faith that we're walking this thing out to the place where people around us are saying, man, I want what you got. I want what you got. Can I talk to you real plain? I smoked a lot of dope and did a lot of stupid stuff before I got born again. But here's the reality of that. I had a friend named Rob Balsinger. He knew me, and he went off, off to school uh, before I got saved. I got saved. It was about a year and a half later that I saw him. And we met matter, but we met somewhere, and we were talking, and, and, and he said, dude, you're really happy. Like, what's going on? And we started talking, and, and, I, and I started telling him, well, my life's really changed. He said, I don't know what you got, but I want a pound of whatever you're smoking. <laughs> Do you understand what I just said? He didn't know what happened to me. He just wanted a pound of whatever I was smoking. Now, listen, <laughs> oh, please hear this the right way. But there's a place where we ought to make the world want a pound of whatever If I knew now what I, if I knew then what I know now, we'd have had a whole lot different conversation. I'd have probably just laid hands on him and said, whack, I'm holy. Okay. <laughs> Can I tell you something? Over and over, I find this is a real scenario. But I get the opportunity to pray with people who don't know what I know, don't believe like I believe. But I honestly believe that if I can lay hands on them, they'll begin to understand. I can jumpstart a revelation in their heart. Because when they encounter him, how many remember the first time you encountered God? Come on, man. I was a little Catholic boy, went into a Pentecostal church. First time I encountered the presence of God, you people freaked me out, I'm telling you. <laughs> it was crazy. It was, oh, I thought, get me out. I actually, the, the first service I went to wasn't real powerful, but the second service I went to was a Holy Ghost barn buster. I'm telling you, God fell in that place. It was amazing. Today, I look at it and go, that was amazing. But I'm sitting there saying, God, if you get me out of here, I promise I won't come back. Because okay? <laughs> I thought y'all were just crazy. Okay, <laughs> But there was something that happened because God put something inside of my heart. There was a deposit that landed here. And I said, you know, I don't know what that was, but I want some more of that. What if we carried ourselves so that everyone around us said, I don't know what that is, but I want some of that. You think that's possible? Read Acts 16. There's a jailer in Philippi. Come on. Whew. Whipped and beaten. Thrown in a cold, dark, damp prison cell full of rats. And, and feces and everything else. If you understood the, the, what that prison cell would have looked like, it's just, it's sickening. And Paul and Silas choose to sing praises to God. They made a choice to let their light shine even when they got beat for letting their light shine. Why? Because I refuse to allow what you don't understand to keep me from walking in what I do understand. I'm called to be a light. Does everybody follow that? That's a big deal. And out of that place, this is what we find happening is what? They start singing, and it sounded so good to God. How many, how many know when you hear good music, what do you do? You tap your toe. Well, the Bible said the earth is his footstool. And he began tapping his toe. What happens? All of a sudden, there's an earthquake. The prison doors spring open. Why? Because somebody chose to be a light. Why do you say that, Pastor? Because you're choosing to walk and be a light in the world around you might set somebody free from their prison cell. If you make the option, I'm going to let my light shine. I don't care what they don't understand. I think sometimes we hold back because we're afraid of what people might say. I think sometimes we hold back because we're afraid. What are they going to think? I even had a guy one time, and I'll talk to you real plain. I was talking to his brother because I felt like, man, this guy, this guy is really, really, really lost, and he needs really, really, really saved, right? And the brother came to me and actually said, man, don't push too hard because we might lose him. We didn't have him. He was caught up in all kind of drugs. He was messed up in all kind of different things, sexual stuff, just stupid bunch of junk. And he's saying, don't push too hard. We might lose. How many understand? You didn't have him to lose. Let's give him the gospel. Why? Because Holy Spirit now has something to work with. I promise you, over and over, the deposits you make will make a difference. In my service this morning, and I'm going to close with this, but in my service this morning, in the second service, I talked between services with a young girl that I knew the story. I didn't even know she was there. But she, she had a traumatic brain injury. And because she was attacked, uh, assaulted by a, a, a kid with autism, I won't get into the whole story, but she, she purposed in her heart that God had placed a call on her life to work with special needs kids. 
And she wasn't going to allow that attack that created a brain injury in her, right, to keep her from stepping into the fullness of what God had called her to. So she walks through the brain injury. She walks through all this stuff, and she gets back on the path, goes back to the school, goes through Virginia University, right? Come on. Why? Because she knows what God's called her to. She's completely restored, completely redeemed. And now the, there's a teacher down there, right, that wants to bring her in to speak to a whole bunch of students that are studying to be a therapist just like she is, occupation therapist, right? So Colleen is her name, and Colleen goes down to teach in this class, and she's saying, Holy Spirit, just use me in whatever way you can. Now, this is in Virginia University. Everybody all right? VCU, right? And here's what's going on. She goes into the class. Now, there's a class. It's only about 20 couple students, right? And the teacher there, can I talk to you? The teacher that invited her is the head of 20,000 students. She's the head of the LGBT union, Right? But she invites Colleen, who's a spirit-filled believer, to come. She teaches on how she walked through this brain injury. She teaches on how she does. She's got an hour, and they say, do 50 minutes of teaching, 10 minutes of Q&A, right? She gets done with all of her teaching. It's 10 minutes left of the Q&A, and she says, anybody got any questions? Now, when she told me the story, here's what she said. Nobody said a word, so she began to fold up her laptop, and right over to her left, there's this young girl, and she's clothed completely from head to toe, all but a little window because she's a Muslim, right? And the little Muslim girl raises her hand, and she says, Miss Colleen, I have to, I, how'd she start at math? She said, I have an apology. I have to apologize, right? Is that what she said? I have to make an apology to you. She said, when you first walked in the room, she said, I had read your memoir because she said like a little bio, a memoir, right? She said, I read your memoir. And she said, when I read it, I began to get excited about it. I began to talk to my family uh, about this lady that was coming. And I was kind of excited to see because she didn't put anything in there about Jesus or anything, right? She just was talking about how she came through brain injury and the trauma and all the things that happened and all the surgery that had to take place for her to be recovered, and now she's back, and she's actually graduated from school and working full-time in her occupation. Follow what I just said? Okay, so in that place, she said, I got excited about that, but when you walked in the room, there was such a bright light behind you, I couldn't look at your face. Whew. She starts to thank her for saying that, and she doesn't know what to do with that. And so she, she looks over, and, and somebody else got a hand. There's two or three other questions, and she's ready to close it out because it's just a, 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 at a 60-minute session. And the, the young girl that asked that first question, the Muslim girl, she raised her hand. And she says, I have one more question. I just want to ask you one more question. How did you get from where you were to where you are? And Colleen said, I, I looked up toward heaven, and she said, I heard the Holy Spirit say, go, 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 go. So, so she said, for the next 35 minutes, she just unfolds the gospel. The whole room is crying. The teacher in the back of the room, tears running down her face. Every student in there is bawling as she shares how Jesus began to touch her and work with her, and she prayed, and God strengthens her, and she said the labels that society was pointing on her, that you'll never be able to amount to anything, that you'll never be able to do this, you'll never be able to do that, and all the labels that society was trying to put on her, Jesus was ripping the labels off one after the other, after the other, after the other. Why? Because you know what? They don't have the right to label you. They didn't make Thank you. Jesus has the right to label you. He's your maker, and he's the one that can call you what you are. And anything less than that, you be a light. She shines her light in that room. She looks now. She was supposed, she was supposed to teach from 6 to 7. It's now 735. She goes out of the room, right? She's done. She goes out of the room, goes to the car, and she just sits there and says, God, I don't know if I represented you well or not, but I really believe I did. I did the best I could with what I had. I let my light shine. She gets an email immediately. She gets another email. She gets an email from the Muslim girl. She gets an email from the teacher, and the teacher says, I want to hear more about this Jesus thing. Come on. Come on. I want to hear more about what Jesus has done in your life. I'm telling you, there's something for you and I to say. Why? Because somebody made a choice to let their light shine. Teacher said, this group has been together for two years. We never, ever had any camaraderie. We never, ever merged in anything outside of class. Nothing's ever happened. She said, when you were done, we stayed for another hour and a half. People told their personal stories. We cried together. We wept together. We held each other. We had an amazing bonding time. We were together for two years. It never happened. And you show up in one class and everything shifts. 
Why? Because light is not afraid to enter into a dark place and actually shine. What if we purposed in our heart? I'm going to let my light shine and nothing's going to keep me from that. Whew. Don't go out of here singing this little light of mine because you ain't got a right to be this little light. You're a blazing inferno. Picture those four towers. Come on, you're a 60-foot tower with a 55-gallon bowl. <laughs> sure. This is a good day. Stand with me all over the place. We call this encounter night. It's time to encounter him. Sure. Can I talk to you? I really believe in this thing. Here's what I know. I've watched God do it time after time after time. There's a place where when people make up their mind, I'm going after this thing. You take a step, he'll back you up. I promise you. Just like Colleen. She took a step, God backed her up. There's another girl that shared with me in the first service. Her name's Cindy. She's done amazing things for the Lord, writes dramas and plays, amazing stuff. If you ever heard of Sight and Sound, she wrote for Sight and Sound Theaters. It's an amazing place. She's done incredible good things. She said, God, I'll do anything for you, but I don't want to have to work with women. Women are catty and hard to get along with. And so you know what God did? She said, he said, I want you to put together a women's conference. <laughs> Why? Because if you don't want to do something, or if you really want to do something, tell God you won't. <laughs> God, I don't want to be a millionaire. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here's the reality of that. He uses her in an incredible place. She puts together a women's conference praying that maybe we'll get 100. She got 270. Why? Because there's a hunger out there. When you take a step, please hear me. When you take a step, Unafraid, I'm going to let my light shine. She called the women's conference baggage check. Set it up like an airport. The whole place was set up like an airport. It's time to check your bags. Whew. Get your passport. You're heading here. So oh, can I talk to you, church, right now? Man, I'm just going to say this. There's a place where you purpose in your heart, I'm going to let my light shine. I refuse. I refuse to sit idly by when this is the most exciting time in the history of the world. Jesus, use me. We've all heard phrases like God's not looking for your ability, just your availability. How many understand that's really true? Some of these old phrases that have been around a long time have been around a long time because there's a lot of truth to it. He's looking for you to be available. He's saying, will you shine for me? Will you let your light shine? Can I say this? The deeper you encounter him, the deeper he'll encounter people around you, through you. He's looking for doors to walk through, and you're one. You're a door for him to get to the people around you. Would you be willing to actually put God to the test? I'm going to ask you something kind of tough. But would you be willing to say tonight, Jesus, this week, this week, if you'll use me, I'll present the gospel to three people who I believe don't know you. Jeez, that's a challenge, man. That's a challenge. But I'll tell you this, don't ever accept a challenge that you're not willing to take up because I promise you, if you tell God you'll do it, he'll give you the opportunity. Are you willing to say, God, I want to be a light? Can I tell you something? I'll say this. I went for years as a pastor, never prayed for someone in public. Invited people to church. Because church is where you pray for people. That's what I thought. So when I began to understand that he said, as you go, preach the gospel, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead. I began to understand that it was an as-you-go gospel. and We ought to do this while we're out on the street. And it wasn't about them coming to church. It was about the church going to them. And I began to, and I said, Lord, I'm going to start praying for people out on the street. Do you know the first time praying for somebody out on the street was a scary thing? I was in Perkins. I thought, man, I'm going to pray for somebody in this restaurant. And there was a guy that started to stand up, and when he did, he grabbed his back, and he said, oh, and I got a word of knowledge. Got to pray for the guy. He was so excited. It was a great thing. And he just really appreciated the prayer. And I thought, that's really good. I left Perkins, went over to Walmart. I thought, man, I can pray for somebody in Walmart. Why? It's the saving place. <laughs> Come on. They advertise. <laughs> Come 
you have this opportunity. It's an amazing opportunity to let your light shine no matter where you're at. I'm just challenging you, man. Are you ready? It doesn't have to be three. Maybe you just say, God, if you'll give me one opportunity, I'll take it. Here's the reality. Can I tell you this? After you prayed for the first one, it felt so good. I was looking for a second one. And after a couple, you know what? You're, you're, come, come on. I remember praying for a guy whose knee was really, really bad. Like he had incredible pain. I prayed for his knee and his knee got healed. And, and I watched it and I was so excited. You know what I was doing? I'm looking for somebody to limp. I dare you. <laughs> come on, come on, limp around me. Why? God's healing knees. Come on, limp. I, I'm like a hound dog. I smell a limp. I smell a bad knee. Come on. <laughs> Why? Because this thing gets in you. It gets exciting. You have this incredible opportunity. Let your light shine before men and they might see the works you do. Glorify your Father, which is in heaven. I'm just simply going to ask you right now, just with your, just before God, I'm not asking you to bow your head and close your eyes because I don't think you ought to be embarrassed. I think, I think you ought to be incredibly privileged. If you're willing to say, Jesus, if you'll give me the opportunity, I'll step through the open door. That's a challenge. But I'm good at offering challenges. I like offering challenges. Why? Because I think people won't do what you... Uh, sometimes you just got to challenge people to do more. Is that okay? If you're here in this place tonight and you're saying... Pastor, I agree with this. This is a gospel. We're called to let our light shine. And Lord, if you'll give me the opportunity, I'm going to step through the door. Maybe some of you do it all the time. It's not even a big deal. But for some of you that maybe haven't, it is a big deal. And I'm simply asking you, if God will give you the opportunity and you're willing to step through it, raise your hand right now because I'm going to pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name right now. God, you see the hands that are raised. You see the hearts that are lifted before you. And I'm asking God, give us, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the opportunities. God, I thank you for open doors. I thank you for increased opportunities. I thank you, Lord, that as we step, the Holy Spirit steps with us. God, I thank you that you'll precede us, soften the heart, and make the way already. Father, we're asking, just, just give us increase, God. Give us increase in our confidence that when we pray, things are going to happen. That when we speak to mountains, mountains have to move. Uh, God, I thank you that there's something that you're doing right now. And I thank you for an empowering in this local body. God, that as we encounter you in this secret place, uh, you'll reward us in that open place. Uh, and I'm asking, God, that you would just move in a magnificent way to the place, Lord, where, where we're, we've got a confidence and a boldness. God, I thank you. Man, I just decree boldness over this house. Uh, I just decree confidence over this house. Uh, a confidence and a boldness to be able to carry the gospel and make an impact and a difference. So, Father, I thank you. I thank you for signs and wonders and miracles. I thank you for testimonies coming in because you challenged us, God, and we rose up to the challenge because anything you ask us to do, you'll meet us there. So, Father, I thank you for what you're doing. Let it be established in our hearts that when we take hands, when we join hands with those that are around us, there's an impact from heaven. And heaven comes and changes earth, and things can't stay the same because we had the boldness to step out. So, Father, I thank you, and I bless this house and this people and this community. God, as the gospel goes forth, in Jesus' name, and the church said, Amen. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord.